There's a renewed push to halt all new prison construction in the state. The legislature passed a moratorium last year, but it was vetoed by then-Governor Charlie Baker, whose administration was moving to build a new women's prison to replace MCI Framingham. Now, with a new administration in charge, lawmakers and advocates are bringing the bill back and urging the state to also take care of the women who are currently at MCI Framingham. I'm joined now by three of those advocates, Elizabeth Matos, the Executive Director of Prisoners Legal Services of Massachusetts, Mallory Honora, the Executive Director of Families for Justice as Healing, and Angelia Jefferson, who was incarcerated at MCI Framingham for 31 years and now works with Families for Justice as Healing as well. Thank you all for being here. Liz, when former Governor Baker vetoed this proposed moratorium last year, he argued that uh, he wasn't looking to expand the state's prison capacity, but that he needed to be able to make the system work efficiently, needed to be able to improve conditions in the system. How close did the legislature come to overriding that veto. Was that ever in the realm of possibility? I think it was in the realm of possibilities, but it didn't happen. It was so late in the session that it made it difficult um, to get it passed. There were efforts, a lot of organizing, especially by Families for Justice and Healing, that we supported to get a special session called so that that could still happen, but uh, ultimately was not successful. And so we are very hopeful that this is the year it gets passed. And I should mention just procedurally, one reason that we're all talking here today, I've been interested in, in this issue for a little while along with others, but there's going to be a hearing next week, right, on Beacon Hill, and you're going to be rallying at the State House to try to build support for the moratorium. Mallory, uh, as your T-shirt <laughs> testifies to very good branding <laughs> on your part, uh, your organization just uh, doesn't only want to put a moratorium on new prison construction in Massachusetts, but you want to decarcerate women and girls. You want to end the incarceration of that population. Can you give me a primer on why you believe that's the right thing to do policy-wise? Sure. So Families for Justice as Healing was founded by Andrea James and the women that she was incarcerated with inside of federal prison. So our organizing started inside of prison by women who were living through the experience themselves. Uh, the conditions of being incarcerated, the separation from their families, the isolation and the deprivation, and women who also had a brilliant vision for what else was possible. Um, and so we've continued that organizing um, brought it home here to Massachusetts and sisters have gone on to found the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls and all of us share this audacious mission of ending the incarceration of women and girls because we know that incarceration only causes further harm and trauma and it doesn't address the issues that folks are facing in their own community right so we need something different um, it is possible to have a different way forward um, and incarceration is not it. And here in Massachusetts, we have a low incarcerated population. This is an opportunity. Lowest rate of any state in the country, right? That's right. And this is an opportunity for us to actually be a model and create what's different looks like and move beyond what we know isn't working, what we know isn't stopping harm from happening, what we know isn't meeting people's needs, and shift those resources into what's going to help women and our children and families thrive. So before I get to you, Angela, and hear about your story and your experience at, at MCI Framingham, can you just describe for me briefly what would you like to see happen if a woman commits a serious crime instead of her being incarcerated for a few decades or more mm -hmm. what should happen and I, I'm dealing in a, a big sort of vague hypothetical here because I don't want to get into particular but a serious crime what should happen instead of incarceration right first I want to say what does investment look like in addressing the root causes of harm right so that we're actually thinking about uh, prevention and making sure what people need, they have what they need in the first place. Um, and then when harm does continue to happen, we know that police, prosecutors, and prisons are not stopping those cycles. And in many cases, they're actually fueling them um, and making it more difficult for people to live in community. So for us, um, we think about transformative justice approach addressing the hurt between people, the harm between people, the cycles of conflict, also pe meeting people's basic needs so that they have what they need uh, to live well, to treat each other well, to take care of their families. Um, all of that is a better approach than what we're doing now. And also I want to talk about real accountability, right? Real accountability isn't happening uh, in a settings of incarceration right now. 
you're sent away, you're isolated, you're deprived of what you need, very often you're continuing to experience harm yourself. And that's not about personal responsibility. That's just about punishment. So what does real accountability look like? Taking responsibility for our actions, having what we need to be good to ourselves and other people. That's really what we're talking about. Angela, we just heard Mallory talk about that the experience of being incarcerated for women, for example, women at MCI Framingham. But I really want to hear what it was like for you. You spent a little more than three decades there after you were convicted of murder. What was that three-decade experience like? And what was it like, among other things, to raise a family while you were incarcerated? Well, it wasn't easy, first of all. Um, on a daily basis, my biggest thing was that I had to educate myself so I can know what was going on with myself, let alone what was going on in the world around me, my new community that I was in at that moment. Um, trying to navigate through the prison and do everything that I had to do for myself, but at the same time raise my three children because I had three children, raise them plus my siblings who I was also raising before I went to prison. Um, it wasn't easy, but I had to do it. That's why I chose to do my time and not allow my time to do me. I chose to get involved in education. I dropped out of school when I was 16 years old after I had my first child. I chose to get involved in education and educate myself. I went on to get my GED where I then earned my bachelor's degree that I have now. I have my cosmetology license. I trained 12 dogs. I am a certified restorative justice keeper. I am a peer supporter. You name it. I did every group, every program that they had in the prison. I wasn't going to let what I did hold me back. I, I felt like I had to rebuild myself because I wasn't in a good place when I entered. And I had to rebuild myself to a place where I felt comfortable with myself and comfortable with giving my children and my siblings advice because they were also going to school. How can I tell them? You all have to stay in school when I dropped out. I want to be a power of example to them and for them. I want to ask you a version of the same question that I just ran by Mallory. If you were able to design a new criminal justice system, a new approach to crime and punishment in one, one fell swoop. What would you like to see happen with women who commit crimes like the one that sent you to jail? What do you think the right approach would be rather than incarceration? There's so many different construction sites going on in the world right now. I was just down in... Um, Alabama a couple of weeks ago, and they're building different um, housing complexes down there also. So for me, I would say take one of those lots that you're building these buildings on and turn that building into a place where the women can go and they can also go out and work. They can get the, group that, the groups that they need. They can get the mental health that they need. They can get the medical help that they need also some type of independent living situation. So when you describe that, uh, some type of independent living situation yes. in which there is, would it involve some restrictions on mobility, for example, a little less mobility than you'd get in a traditional prison setting? I just want to make sure that I'm thinking this through as clearly as I can. Okay. Yes. Okay. It would, you know, restrict a little bit, but at the same time, give them the opportunity to rebuild themselves. Everyone needs a chance. Uh, let me, yeah, I, I stopped flipping my cards as I was listening to your story, so bear with me. i got to get up to speed here. <laughs> Liz, let me go back to you. Um, I want to make sure that I am clear on PLS's mission vis-a-vis -vis their group's mission. Are you also in support of total decarceration of women and girls at PLS? That should be the goal. We similarly, you know, we focus on prison conditions in our yeah. advocacy work in the civil rights and human rights of folks inside and our many, many years, over 50 years now of work has really demonstrated that what we have primarily is a culture problem in this institution, a very much a focus on punishment and a digression over many years from rehabilitation. 
Um, and rehabilitation, we know, happens best in the community. As Mallory was saying, you know, this is a lot, the root causes of incarceration are things that are, things that we can address as a community, as a society. Throwing tens of millions of dollars into a new fancy construction site is not going to, to change the, the cultural problems that really lead to the harm that's being done to people who are incarcerated. And the women's population is the smallest, right, in the system. This is, is an opportunity, as Mallory was saying, to shrink the population with existing mechanisms that are not being fully utilized right now with, that exist within the law, to release women who can safely be released, and really establish better pathways to reentry so that people stay out um, when they get out because that is that's an infrastructure that needs the 50 million dollars far more than a new building i want to ask each of you to weigh in on an argument that was made by the boston globe editorial page when they were saying that uh, the moratorium was a bad idea last year but i think it's also probably something that some of our viewers are going to be saying to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the Globe tapped into a way of thinking about criminal justice and imprisonment that is not unique to the paper's editorial page. So let's take a look at how the Globe put it. Back in July 2022, in an editorial title, Put the Brakes on the Prison Moratorium, the paper wrote, people will commit crimes, they will be sentenced to prison, and our criminal justice system needs to provide those inmates with better conditions than it does currently. Unless and until we become a community of saints, a five-year moratorium risks ushering in an area of potentially cruel and unusual punishment. What I hear there is two different ideas. First, we need to be able to improve prison conditions, but also it's appropriate for there to be a measure of punishment if people commit crimes, and they're going to continue to. Mallory, I'd love to hear your response first, and then uh, I'd love to hear mm -hmm. from the two of you as well. Yeah, first of all, the Department of Correction has already been cited for Eighth Amendment violations by the Department of Justice. So it is a cultural problem. The DOC is unwilling and unable to take care of people uh, in DOC custody, and that's been a problem for a very long time. So construction is not going to solve that problem. What we're saying is, yes, the conditions in Framingham are bad, and incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women have been saying that for many more years than we've been fighting for the prison moratorium. Uh, those have not been addressed. So right now, what we need to do is pause and focus on releasing women, bringing women home to the community where they can actually be safe because they cannot be safe in the Department of Correction. Um, and we actually had a reply to that editorial. Our founder, Andrea James, had an editorial that said, what we should actually be trying to do is shut down Framingham forever without rebuilding it or replacing it because we can do something different here. But I want to get you, and, and by the way, feel free to hop in. You don't need to, to wait for me mm -hmm. to uh, call in here. What about the idea, and again, I think some of our viewers will be thinking this to themselves right now. What about the idea that, okay, if someone commits a serious crime, yes, it's important to think about ways that they can ultimately reintegrate with society, become productive, uh, help their own families, but at the same time, it's also appropriate to punish that person, that man or woman, because they did something that we view in society as anathema. Um, what would you say to people who might be thinking that to themselves or muttering that to themselves as they watch yeah, this? Yeah, I interview? mean, of course, but it's really, that is rooted um, in right, historical notions of what punishment gets us. And as Mallory was saying, it's really, what people really want is accountability. Taking accountability is not should not be equated with punishment because they're actually two totally different things. You can be punished for a decade or two decades, but never actually engage in a process of accountability or um, kind of restoring or repairing a relationship with the quote unquote victim's family, right? And this isn't, this is an issue that is global, right? We are, there are many countries that engage in different processes around atrocities that happen. There are truth and reconciliation commissions. There are all kinds of processes around um, preparing relationships when harm is done that don't amount to punishment. So I think that is, I think challenging the notion of punishment and seeing what is that actually resulting in in terms of public safety is really important. And the other piece that I would say is that what people really want, like the punishment is something we, we kind of revert to. But even with our own children, right, what we're teaching, the, what we give them when we give them consequences is partly conditioning and partly accountability, right? Like we want you to understand this wasn't okay. But the, the consequences are only until 
there's an understanding. So when someone's incarcerated, just throwing them in a cell is not doing anything to actually, we know statistically, we're not preventing crime by placing people in in prisons and jails. That is a very clear statistic that already exists. It's not a deterrent. Before I get your take here, Angelia, um, I want to just, just check on something. You said yeah. the quote-unquote victim. Mm -hmm. At one point, do you take issue with the idea that there are victims in certain cases? No, I mean, there are victims, for okay. sure. I think there are plenty of people who are actually not guilty of the crime they were convicted of, in incarcerated as well, and that's something that has, I think, had more light shed on it as people yep, have for sure. um, challenged the, the, that um, through innocence projects and things like that. But the other side is that not everyone perceives themselves as a victim, right? There are many families who understand that what is happening is a result of just systemic oppression and see themselves as part of resolving the problem and not necessarily a dichotomy of victim and perpetrator. So I was also challenging that and just respecting that there, there are people who others would consider victims who don't necessarily want to be called a victim. Angelia, what's your take on the Globe's objections? Is that people are going to commit crimes and the conditions need to be improved while they're doing time for the crimes. I think it all starts with the communities. You know, if there was better jobs, if there was better health care, if there was better mental health, if there were better things for the communities, the community that I come from, if there were better things for the black and brown people in my community, I think a lot of the crimes wouldn't happen. But with the crimes that has happened, I still do not think that prison is the way. I still, once again, independent living, independent living. We have an approach called reimagining communities. Uh, with the National Council, and that is because we're not reimagining prisons anymore. They've been called reformatories and correctional centers, and now trauma-informed prisons, gender-responsive prisons. And a threat a I'm hearing from the two right. of you is that, that they can't be reformed. A prison is a prison a is a prison. And, uh, yeah. you know, MCI Framingham was built 150 years ago. Shame on us if we can, the only answer that we can come up with what to do with women 150 years later is just another prison. Closing question, uh, we, we got very philosophical there, which I think is important to do because you're steeped in this work, but it's a new way of thinking to a lot of people. And I think it's, I think there's value in talking through. What are the political prospects for the moratorium that you have been working for this year? Is there as much momentum in the legislature and is Governor Healy on board with the idea? It's a critical moment, and uh, we feel like community members set a mandate last year. That's how we got a bill to a governor's desk in a single session. We're knocking doors, we're making phone calls, and there's wide agreement that we need a prison moratorium. So we're definitely going to let the legislature know that this is what the people want. We want something different. Um, we believe it's a good opportunity at this hearing to, to raise a sense of urgency because we know that the executive branch of our state is currently meeting with architects about the new women's prison. Um, and that's and gone on through the, the first months of the hearing that's administration, right. right? Okay. Do you have anything to add there? Well, just, you know, I think it remains to be seen where the Healy administration is at on this, but I think it's notable that uh, the current budget does not include a huge increase for building and that there's hopefully some very serious consideration happening of what this would get us. I have business owners and firm lawyers asking me, but why would we spend this much money on a new prison now? Um, so I think there are some really practical questions to be asking and also to be challenging the notion that a a trauma-informed, gender-affirming, whatever prison is going to change things. We should be caring about impact and results and not not making huge moves like this that well, we don't know what that I could, I could, I, I'm, I got to wrap it here because yeah. otherwise I won't be giving our next guest any chance to spare. I wish we had another hour to talk about this, though, because it's very complicated, very interesting, and very important. Uh, Angelia, Mallory, and Liz, thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. Thank you.